Let thou, who art without sin, cast the first hate comment. Zara have 2,259 stores, and they do. Let's say, for example, they have uh, one blouse on offer in all their stores uh, in a season. In any particular season, they have a shirt on offer. Um, I think we can safely assume that. So let's say they have 10, you know, a, a size range of this blouse on the rack in each of their stores. And for ease, we can say it takes one yard of fabric to make that blouse. So 10 blouses on one peg of the rack times 2,259 stores is 22,590 blouses just in that one style, right? Then how many different items are on offer at any one time in most stores? Let's go low and say 250. That's every style of jean, bra, basic tee to sequin dress. So that's 5,647,500 items in store at any one time at all Zara's. So if Zara alone is making nearly 6 million pieces a season, which honestly seems low to me, but let's go low and imagine they're using around 4 million yards of fabric a season, times at least four seasons or turnovers in the store each year, again, seems low, for 16 million yards of fabric a year. And this is just thinking about fabric use at one store out of thousands of retailers all around the world. So they're using a lot of fabric out there. And let's face it, most of it is polyester. In a Greenpeace article about microplastics released by Polyester Fibers, they state, from 2000 to 2016, the use of polyester by the global garment industry increased from 8.3 to 21.3 million tons annually. At the same time, the world's total garment production has roughly doubled. In 2014, it crossed the threshold of 100 billion items. The share of synthetic fibers, mainly polyester, has risen from under 50 to more than 60%. There seems to be no end to the polyester success story. The overall apparel consumption is projected to rise by 63% by 2030, at which point the world's population will consume a staggering 102 million tons of clothing, equivalent to 500 billion t-shirts. This avalanche of textiles will consist of almost 70% polyester. And they seem to have the sources to back that up, so I will link to that article in the description below. So polyester is a big polluter, is made from oil and falls apart into tiny little microplastics that will last a millennia. But Bianca, cotton uses so much water, it's terrible for the environment. <sighs> Fine, what is this, school? Polyester production emits the greatest CO2 emissions, ranging from 7.2 to 9.52 kilograms of CO2 per ton of fiber. Again, CO2 emissions associated with cotton range widely from 2.35 to 5.89 kilograms of CO2 per ton of fiber. It shows that polyester production is the most energy intensive, requiring approximately 10 times more energy than organic cotton, which consumes the least energy. Consequently, polyester emits the greatest quantity of CO2 emissions, but in this case, it is only four times that of organic cotton, the smallest emitter of CO2 emissions. However, the best overall performer in the ecological footprint context is traditional organic hemp, two times better than the worst performer cotton in this area. In terms of water consumption, cotton requires 9,758 kilograms of water per kilogram of fiber, while hemp requires 2 to 3,000 kilograms of water per fiber. As hemp presents a tiny fraction, 0.15% of world textile production, it seems highly unviable option for consumers, end quote, because I just want to make a note here to say that there's a reason that there's not much hemp out there, and that's because A, people like to think that hemp and marijuana are the same crop, and B, the people who make cotton don't want anyone to be growing hemp because it's a better option and that will put them into having less business. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> back to the quote. Uh, production of polyester, even if the energy requirements are met by renewable sources, cannot be sustained indefinitely. The raw material, oil, is a non-renewable resource which will in time run out. However, it is suggested that it is a wiser use of oil than simply burning it for energy production. The other toxic emissions associated with the production of polyester have also not been accounted for in this study. 
<clears throat> this also applies to cotton and to a limited extent hemp. The analysis also fails to recognize the important role of crop cultivation and fabric production processes at the social and economic level. While for polyester this may not be such a focal factor, it certainly is crucial for cotton, especially cotton grown in developing nations. These quotes are from a report on ecological footprint and water analysis of cotton, hemp, and polyester comparing the three fibers. So cotton uses a ton of water, yes, but at least it's a plant, and when it breaks down into fibers again, they're biodegradable like any other plant is. Polyester uses less water but more energy and is literally petroleum-based, a fossil fuel that has to be extracted out of the earth somehow, and we can probably assume not by magic. <laughs> And the microplastics from production to every single wash cycle at home end up in the oceans into the environment to last, you know, millions of years. If fossil fuels are the number one contributor to harmful emissions to climate change, and they are, then the first things first, we should be doing our best as seamstresses to use less and buy less polyester fabric. Still, just 100 fossil fuel companies are responsible for 70% of the world's emissions. And how convenient for them that the masses are too busy bashing one another's heads in with their keep cups over plastic straws to demand something be done. So, ew, polyester is literally, you know, petroleum, plastic, and terrible. And also, ew, gross. Cotton is also bad for the environment and uses too much water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those are just the two big boys. Rayon is no better, uses a lot of chemicals to break down wood pulp into fiber, which is what rayon is. Um, there's some rayons that are better than other rayons. Obviously, there are people who are working behind the scenes on polyester, on blends, on uh, tensile, rayons, viscose, things like that, to try and make these fibers more sustainable and better because we have to find solutions. There are people who, you know, do textile science as their job. Thank goodness. And technically linen is a little bit better, I think, on water than cotton, but it's more expensive, I think, both to grow and then for like the end consumer as well. So linen is not like a savior of this at all either. There's really no, there's really no uh, good fiber. Well, actually, if you personally own a sheep, like own a sheep that you like lovingly care for and shear a couple times a year to get its wool and then like you spin that wool yourself into yarn and then like you knit your own clothes from that, that's probably not so bad. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if wool is like the most sustainable of all fibers being like quite renewable and stuff. Let me go look that up. No, no, see, uh, on a large scale you run into the same problem we do with most livestock, which is that those sheeps really <laughs> too much methane which and become like an emissions problem in themselves so really every fiber is problematic making textiles is bad for the environment 99 percent of the time but we have laws against nudity and some places do get quite chilly and now tangent number one i bet the quilting market uses more cotton than the home apparel sewing market does at joann's for example the largest and most accessible fabric store chain in the united states the majority of fabrics are quilting cottons and then polyester fleeces for quick blankets. I didn't dig too deep, but I would also love to see a study comparing the sizes of these markets. Um, I have a quote here from some sewing report, Quiltonomics article, that says the 2014 Quilting in America survey found that there are 16 million active quilters in the country, meaning that one out of every 20 Americans is a quilter. Their buying power each year equates to 3.76 billion with quote unquote dedicated quilters spending over $3,200 annually. Unfortunately, it seems near impossible to find the apparel home sewing market separated out from the craft market in general. So while you can find studies covering the sewing and craft market numbers and growth, etc., there doesn't seem to be a breakdown between people making clothes and everything else. However, if you look at what Joann's carries, I think that is the biggest tell, and I'm sure they do have that data somewhere, and they choose to devote an entire section of their store to quilting cotton, and the rest to A, those fleeces for crafts and blankets, B, Home decor fabrics, another entire section. C, flannel. I guess a lot of people make pajamas. And D, to polyester special occasion fabrics for prom dresses and Halloween costumes, aka the occasional sewing project. The people who make one or two things a year, if that at max. They have a few sorry aisles of actual apparel fabric, most of it still in polyester. If the apparel sewing market was actually a big portion of their customer base, this would be reflected in their merchandise, but it just isn't. Home apparel sewing has had a resurgence, but it is nothing compared to the rest of the crafting pie eating up even this smaller section of the textile market. And tangent two here. Speaking of material, materials, a painter uses canvases, brushes, paint, a sculptor may work in acrylic, bronze, marble that must be hewn from somewhere, and a woodworker requires that trees at one point be felled. I make clothes, 
textiles are my material. I express myself through them and making clothes is also my craft, an almost meditative state that helps me with my mental health. Some humans, many humans, like making things. The artisan was like an entire quote-unquote class of person for a lot longer than anyone has been an IT professional, for example. Making something from start to finish gives me A, something to do with my hands while my brain is full of bees, and two, the satisfaction of having completed a thing. Would we take away a painter's materials because the canvas is not sustainable? Who gets to decide what materials are essential for artists and which artists should be shamed instead? Is all art that requires new physical goods a no-go? When sewing and quilting and embroidery are traditionally women's work and considered craft first and art rarely, is it easier to deride fashion as an art form because it is a traditionally girly thing? A discussion for another time, but fashion is also not just a hobby for me. It's also my vocation. And all this is still just considering the fabric, not the labor. If I sew something myself, I'm still consuming textiles. The difference is when I make a cotton poplin dress, for example, I use three yards of brand new fabric and I intend to use the dress for at least 10 years, if not many more. Plus cotton will biodegrade. Not that the polyester thread I use would or the nylon zipper. At this point in my sewing journey, over 10 years of sewing under my belt, as it were, I am making things in classic shapes, in natural fibers, with finished seams to last, because I want them to be nice enough that they will become, quote-unquote, new, vintage, in a sea of pilled polyester fleece jackets 50 years from now. Now, I'm not going to go digging for all the stats, because I imagine they are out there, but if I buy a brand new fabric from Joann's and make a dress at home, I bet that dress still has a lighter carbon footprint than a fast fashion one would because it wasn't sent to a factory, then a warehouse, and then a store after it was made. I've skipped at least a few last legs of the journey a typical dress makes around the world. And all this is still just considering the fabric, not the labor. And if the textile situation is horrendous, millions of yards of fabric a year for each retailer the world over, the labor situation, as we know, is worse. Polluting and destroying the planet hurts now and will hurt more in 20 years, but people are dying in factory accidents today, people are exploited today, and that is equally, if not more, unacceptable. But I don't know if the fabric factories are the same. They certainly contribute to pollution. Maybe the textile factories are also unsafe. Maybe the farmers growing the cotton are exploited too, and in this capitalist hellscape, I have very little faith. And I also don't know where the arugula that's rocket for you Brits, in my fridge comes from either. And when I go places, sometimes I have to put like lots of goo made from uh, like fossilized prehistoric sea creatures, I believe mostly, aka gasoline, into my car in order to make it go. So I still s sew, um, and I, I sew a lot, a lot more than most people, actually. Um, I have a passion for it. I went to university for fashion design, and I chose not to enter the industry because I saw it was monstrous. I still sew many dozens of garments a year. It is part of my job now. I demonstrate how to sew. I'm trying to learn how to teach and also to teach people to sew online. That's a large portion of what my job is now. I do this full time, but I don't think that I or any other home apparel sewer is a drop in this very corroded, very overflowing bucket. The fashion industry must change. The way that we humans, humans in general, consume textiles and clothing has to change. And, you know, on a massive scale, because if Zara make one less dress each season, it's going to make a much bigger difference than if I make one less dress a year, which is why shopping secondhand and vintage is best of all. But there is, you know, not necessarily good secondhand options in every neighborhood, in every city, in every country. There's not always a good selection of different sizes when it comes to vintage clothing, and not all used clothing is of good quality either. Um, it's, you know, we're getting a lot of the fast fashion is in thrift stores now. Um, they stopped making nice clothes in like 1990. Home apparel sewers are not the problem. That's just what I believe personally, and heck yes, you can disagree with me. I'm not saying it's morally right to make new garments. I'm saying I know what I do is a little wrong, like how I know driving my car is a little wrong and buying avocados is probably pretty messed up. But I cannot chase being a saint when the devils at the top of the hills have no intention of doing anything to keep the world from burning. If all home apparel sewers stopped tomorrow, nothing in the global textile market would change. Most people do not know how to sew a button back on if it falls off. Home apparel sewing is a large market and one that is tiny, tiny, tiny compared to the actual apparel industry. 
Individual responsibility and the problem of climate change is not a new debate, but the science says there are things we can do that are more impactful than others, and oddly, consuming fast fashion isn't even on their lists. What are the top things as individuals, quote unquote, they say we can do to help? One, have one less child. Done. <laughs> no, thank you. Not my jam. Two, live car free. Not always an option for a lot of people if they don't live in a walkable city. Three, avoid at least one transatlantic flight. Not that hard, that one. Uh, four, eat a plant based diet. Because as previously mentioned, livestock equals lots of methane. And that's just one of the problems with meat, but there, there are a lot. Also, further down these lists and more relevant to us in this conversation, um, seems to be wash clothing in cold water and hang clothes to dry. But I would add to that also just have clothes that you have to wash less in general. Um, so wearing like wearing a slip underneath your dress so that you can wear the dress multiple times and you just have to wash your slips every once in a while, that is something where you are technically running less loads of laundry and that's probably good. Honestly, I am surprised buy less clothing isn't on these sort of lists. But if you're not buying fast fashion, you're already doing one of the what they call small impact individual things at the bottom of their lists. When we stop supporting fast fashion, we already tell companies by removing our dollars that their practices are unwelcome and if they want our money to survive as a company, they will have to change. This is not a given. We have so much work to do on this issue. Fast fashion is not solved, Fashion Nova wish ASOS. And if and when there are even more organic textile choices available at fabric stores, there already are some now, but it's still a very small selection, but I'm hoping that, that it will expand. I think it has to and therefore will. And when it does, obviously I'll make those more organic choices more and more often. And when the entire like, culture shifts on this issue and you know the world wakes up to the overconsumption of textiles, especially polyester and things like that, I mean, I will continue to shift on this and I, I will be both, you know, if there's a monumental shift, I will be both relieved and disgruntled, yes. The good news is some of Mood stock, for example, comes from offcuts, designer cast offs, which means when a designer or brand doesn't use all the fabric they had made, they sell it to Mood instead of binning it, and then Mood sells it to me. Well, and probably a few other people too. There are other fabric shops online that function exclusively in this way, only selling cast off or resale fabrics like this, or you can shop for vintage yardage on Etsy or eBay or in person at thrift stores, estate sales. So the most ethical new fabric, unused before, uh, virgin fabric as it were, comes from these sort of sources. The fabric is new, but also sort of saved from being wasted at least after all that effort it cost for it to be made in the first place. I shop primarily with moodfabrics.com because they have the best selection of the kind of apparel fabric I like. And sometimes some of it is a resale sort of thing like I've just stated, which is nice, but also I buy purely new fabrics from them too. And they do often have organic options. And I prefer to shop with them because the quality is always great. The service is always good. And unlike fabric.com, they aren't owned by Amazon, our buddy Bezos, which is a plus in my book as well. Part of the way I try and be more sustainably minded as an individual person is by spending my money with smaller or independent companies whenever possible. Is it always possible? No, but I don't shop with certain companies on either, I guess, uh, a sort of activist or moral grounds mindset. And, and now, uh, my, my thoughts on, on secondhand fabrics. Why don't I recycle used home decor fabrics into clothes? Don't want to make this sound like a judgment on other people. Because if you find a hella cute set of curtains from the 1960s at the thrift store and make a super chic shift dress, I'm totally happy for you. But here's the deal with me personally and textiles at the thrift store. Most tablecloths are durable polyester. Most curtains are thick or again, polyester. Home decor fabrics are made to be durable first, to resist fading in your window, to withstand wiggling on your breakfast banquette, to throw in the wash when someone knocks over their wine glass. So they are not made to be breathable, comfortable next to the skin all day, lightweight enough to drape nicely in most designs. A thick cotton jacquard tablecloth has its applications in apparel. A swing coat, perhaps, where you would use a thicker fabric anyhow, but I don't think making garments out of used home decor fabrics is the angelic answer. Because even if I decide I don't mind wearing a dress made out of a poly blend curtain fabric, will the next person want to wear it too? Can the garment be worn again by somebody else or is it stiff and sort of like wearing a couch? If you've got a poly blend on your hands, what matters more, reusing that fabric or the microplastic it releases in the wash once you've made it into a garment and tossed it in the machine? The best home decor thrifted fabrics have got to be real silk or cotton curtain panels. And then after that, chiefly sheets. Sheets are probably the best option here. Although honestly, 100% cotton sheets are rare enough these days. So if you find those, you might as well use them for sheets. 
but still, that's a lot of usable lighter weight cotton that can be used as yardage. Of course, I don't think we should shame anyone who decides to only use 100% recycled or secondhand textiles. I just also don't particularly think we should shame anyone who uses new fabric either. Both have pros and cons. There is not a one-size-fits-all solution here, other than to completely revolutionize the way most of the world consumes textiles and clothes. Would it be better if I rode a bike everywhere instead of driving my car? Unequivocally, yes. My vintage curls wouldn't quite look the same when I showed up. Every single thing we consume, from gasoline to electricity to avocados to clothing, has an impact. But I'm not ready to judge a person on such a weighted scale trying to navigate this messed up world with a little bit of joy. If someone is doing a massive Primark haul every week, okay, okay, then I would judge them. But I still judge Primark itself more. And I still think someone on a super low income with no good thrifting around buying clothes at Primark isn't evil for making a fast fashion purchase when that is essentially all that is available to them. There is nothing but nuance and like additional levels of complexity to this entire conversation. What am I doing to make my sewing more sustainable? I didn't go into fashion design after university because of the industry. The merchandising classes I had to take for my program made me sick. Yeah, I don't want 2,259 stores with millions of products with my name sewn into them. What am I doing? I chose to stare my student loan debt in the face and not pursue a career in fashion, which up until that point had been my dream. I could not see a way to become an independent designer in a sustainable and ethical way. Instead, now I want to teach a few hundred people to make a dress they will love for decades to come. They can make it from a brand new brocade or a bargain bin Bulbasaur kids sheet set from Savers. That part is up to them. I'd rather teach people to pattern draft and sew so that they can consume textiles, yes, but do the labor themselves at home instead of contributing to that one facet of the human cost of clothing. Do the scales work out in my favor? Am I pure enough? No, but I never can be. I'm just one person living in this like rotting world that keeps perilously building on its own detritus. I'm gonna make a cute dress because on like a geologic scale, I'm not gonna live very long. But that polyester blouse from Zara sure is. And is that a little wrong? Yes, but I am literally Effie Trinket, so what were you expecting me to say? I am a maximalist living in a world that demands minimalism for my species to survive. But I am not the biggest offender, which doesn't make it okay, but also I'm not really personally holding out like a ton of hope for this whole experiment in general. And like the entitled white American and millennial that I am, I want to look damn glamorous for this upcoming apocalypse. So yes, one of the main things I do is try and make clothing that will last into future generations that can be used for a very long time before it has to be thrown out. But as far as like best practices go for when you're still learning to sew, um, probably those thrift store sheets. But even buying 100% cotton muslin and cotton thread may be more reliably 100% biodegradable at least. You kind of have to choose which sort of impact you'd like your mock-ups to have. New cotton is not great for the environment, though at least unbleached muslin is less of a offender as dyeing is part of what uses so much water and chemicals as well, so at least muslin's not as bad as, say, a colorful quilting cotton. But sheets from the thrift store may be a poly blend, so they could leach those microplastics again and live longer than you ever will. So again, there is no 100% angelic choice really, but if you think your mock-ups are bad, again, remember how many designs get mocked up in the industry each year and that you really just cannot compare. And then more about my own sort of personal choices when it comes to all of the trade-offs, pros and cons, and decisions to be made, all the considerations that go into the kind of situation here. I primarily use natural fibers and I make things to a higher standard so they will last for me, but also for the next person. A healthy handful of vintage garments from the 40s and 50s in circulation in the vintage collecting market today are home sewn pieces made by home apparel seamstresses from that time. They have lasted so that the vintage lovers now are still wearing and enjoying them. I hope to constantly improve my skills so that I am making what will hopefully amount to be heirloom pieces, things that someone else can wear in the future too. I do not buy any fast fashion, I exclusively make my own clothes or buy vintage or second hand, other than socks and underwear. Sorry, I, I do want your granny's wardrobe, but not her panties, so sue me. <clears throat> and people like to get mad that people go thrifting, but, and I quote, with 84% of used clothing ending up in landfills, that's 400 million pounds thrown away annually in New York City alone. Now, saving a skirt from that fate so that either I or someone else who will appreciate it can wear it instead doesn't sound so evil to me. This issue is actually, like, 
<clears throat> a whole nother can of worms and we're not going to get into it in this video. Okay, you're great. Demanding individual purity is a false goal. Perfection, an impossible one. We could all be doing more to create a more sustainable way of living. It's a given. We all know this. And if you want to make every right choice that you can, then that is up to you and how far you want to go in the individual individualism side of this two, you know, sides of the coin that need to happen here or two things that need to happen. Yes, individuals need to make changes, but those the biggest changes we can make are not necessarily like whether or not you make another scrapbook, it's whether or not you install solar panels or like how you're going to heat your house or if you're going to get an electric car or not. Like these are the biggest impacts we can have and we need to get more people on board with the big things so that we can cause big change because little tiny changes, while good and incremental, they all don't add up to us not drowning. I personally uh, remain aware that I am guilty and culpable in climate change on an individual level. I don't think I can do anything to offset my carbon emissions, to offset this guilt. Um, I also don't, it wasn't exactly my choice to be born into the world either. So I try not to feel too guilty about being here and like using resources and trying to have a little bit of joy and, you know, en enjoy the one life that I've been given, which in itself is a gift. Um, if it wasn't sewing, it's not just sewing, it's also everything else. And if it wasn't sewing, it would still be something else. Like all things, you are not the problem. Everyone is the problem. And unfortunately, unlike everyone else, at least, I mean, at least you're asking the question. Uh, not everyone else is on this, this level yet. I mean, most fashion places, even on like online stores are still open. So clearly even the whole like shift to not buying crap. We haven't won that battle yet even, you know? The person who decides how sustainable your sewing will be is you. You're the only one who can decide where you feel comfortable and where you want to draw your lines. There are pros and cons on many different facets of this whole debate. But if it makes you feel any better, just know that you're definitely not using as much fabric as I am. Thank <laughs> you.